Okay, welcome to the Gold Room. First talk is Kevin Cody. We're gonna learn about rest is the sweet sauce of labor. And without further ado, Kevin Cody. Morning. Everyone, get, get cozy, comfy. You don't have to stay in the whole time. There's some seats. Uh, I'm sure people will be funneling out halfway through, so feel free to, to uh, fill in. So, uh, yeah. Oh, that's not the right thing, though. All right, we're going to be starting real soon, so everybody, please get settled in. Thank you. That's them from the next room, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so... Um, yeah, we're going to talk, be talking about rest today. My name's Kevin Cody. Uh, if you don't know me, I am from Pittsburgh, so uh, yeah, Yenzer at heart here, a little bit north uh, near the uh, Grove City, Newcastle area. I'm a principal application security consultant with Invisium. We're a uh, um, boutique AppSec firm. I'm a bit of a vulnerability stumble upon her. -er. If you haven't uh, worked with me in before, you, you'll know that. Mainframe enthusiast. People who've been through my talks before know this is kind of how I start off. So uh, I'm going to go a little bit further today. Um, yes, there is more. So I'm also the OWASP Pittsburgh chapter leader. So if you're interested in the stuff we're going to be talking about today, please come out to the OWASP meetings. There's going to be one next week, uh, July 20-something or other. I don't know what just happened. There it is. All right. Uh, July, next Thursday, I think it's like July 28th, or, or I'm sorry, June 28th, um, we have an OWASP Pittsburgh meetup, so uh, definitely take a look at there, or the OWASP wiki. I publish them on, on there as well. I also help out with the Three Rivers Information Security Symposium, which is a group of a bunch of different uh, Pittsburgh or, uh, InfoSec groups. We put on a security symposium that uh, is set for October. I'll be speaking at B-Sides Cleveland tomorrow, so any of you folks who are going from here today over there, completely different subject, uh, et cetera. And uh, anyone uh, who comes out to Steel City InfoSec, I, I frequent there as well. So that's a little bit about me, but that's it. No more talk about me. Let's talk about some fun stuff um, and get rolling. So today, we're going to talk about monolithic versus microservices, because I think that's a really good kind of intro into the REST uh, 101, REST paradigm, and why we are so REST-centric uh, today. Then I'm going to go into REST 101, so we'll, we'll uh, go into that. I'm going to discuss some tooling around uh, testing REST, both from a security and uh, operations and, and uh, QA perspective go into some security focuses and concerns, and then uh, I'll get into a little bit of a technical deep dive. Hopefully the demo gods are, are, are good to us in here, and then proceed to some summaries and takeaways. All right, so to dive into this, this is the gist. Uh, this is an awesome graphic from uh, Alvaro Sanchez on Twitter. This is describing monolithic services versus microservices, right? This is uh, This is... Uh, one of my favorite graphics on this, but uh, in, in reality, so monolithic applications, right? How many folks in here work for an enterprise who you either develop on, test security of, do compliance on what you would consider like a monolithic application? Traditional, tried and true, either thick client app or web app that uses one platform, so like four people. Okay, cool, all right. Um, now what we see here are, are, are large code bases, um, usually they're bloated. They have a lot of, of carryover from, from different years and developments and strategies, et cetera. They are a de detriment to new features, right? So when you try to introduce new features for monolithic applications, it's pretty tough because you have to consider all of this bloat, all of this years of, of history, whatever uh, platform, you know, Java.net, et cetera, that uh, you're, you're used to, or I'm sorry, that the uh, monolithic application is written on. And it's kind of hard to, to, you know, introduce some of those new features. And Therefore, they are stagnant in the face of technology, right? We kind of just have to drag them along and keep going. And from a security perspective, they're difficult to assess, right? Because there's just, uh, they're old in the tooth, they're using a, a, an old version of, of Java or whatever the case is, they're, they're, they're uh, usually pretty difficult to assess because of everything else I just said. So then we move on to microservices. So microservices kind of work as this pieces of a larger puzzle. And I'll break down in a moment, uh, give you an example of that. 
But the cool thing about microservices are they're easier to distribute across different data centers or different cloud hosting uh, environments, et cetera. Um, you can migrate them, they're easier to maintain. They're more in line with the agile development process because microservices can be literally broken up into portions and you can work on those independently. They're usually easier to document than a monolithic application because there's usually services that are like, query this or delete that, et cetera. So they're usually easier to document. You don't have to uh, really d dig down into the code or, or pull someone out of retirement and say, hey man, what did this do again? I don't know what this did or does. Uh, but they're still kind of difficult to assess. Even microservices, because of how modular they are and how everything kind of pieces together, they're still difficult to assess. But hopefully some of the stuff that we'll go over today will help us get over that barrier. Uh, so to recap, we're kind of in the same place, right? They're both kind of difficult. Some seem good, some seem bad. But let me break down, you know, kind of what microservices look like today. So to give you an example, let's take a retail app, right? It has a shopping cart, checkout, and you can buy stuff, right? That's your traditional retail application web app uh, on, on the internet. But you also want to introduce, because the business really wants, ship to store. So now you have to take inventory out of the warehouse and ship it to the store, and the store people have to be ready to pick it up, ready to distribute it, et cetera. Customers also want store inventory, so now it's backwards. You have to query your internal store uh, inventory, know where things are at, where people can go pick things up, et cetera. Well, now someone wants wish lists and, and social and sharing and registries. Well, that's a completely different thing than shopping cart, check out, and buy stuff, right? So now you're integrating with OAuth, or you're, um, uh, you have the ability to send out invites or sharing, or you have to link the inventory from the in-store to online so people know when uh, your friend goes and picks up the Baby's R Us registry item that it's no longer on that registry, right? So things keep kind of growing here. Well, now someone says, okay, well, now we want augmented reality for our mirrors and store finders, right? Have we seen where you get out your phone and you can, you know, point it at it and it'll say, okay, here's the GPS of the nearest store. Walk this way, make a left, you know, go over here, right? Oh, and we want beacons in the store so we know where our customers are at, what they're looking at, et cetera, et cetera. That's a lot of stuff. Can you imagine trying to implement this stuff in a monolithic application that has, you know, that's written on Java 1.6 or on .NET, you know, 2, and, uh, you know, you're trying to, you know, implement all this ad hoc uh, a la carte things, and uh, they don't really talk well together. They're not even from the same, you know, uh, decade, right? We're talking about early 2000s or possibly even 99, uh, 98, and we're talking about uh, technologies that have just been really coming into the fold in the last uh, five uh, or less years. So how do we deliver that content to a consumer in a way that a consumer can actually use it, right? So today's picture, what today looks like, is a bevy of different hosting options, right? We have on-prem, cloud, hybrid, whatever today's soup du jour is, right? Uh, I'm sure I heard something, HP has this thing where you buy equipment, you host it in your data center, then you pay them money to unlock the equipment, you know, some cool thing, I don't know. Um, so that's, that's, that's one piece of the puzzle. Then there's this whole service-oriented architecture, which is a, another piece. Then we throw microservices on top of that. Um, we have to make sure everything's talking in a standard uh, data interchange format, which is interesting when we're talking about all these discrete pieces. Then we parse that on the client side using something like a JavaScript framework or a single page application so that all of these different discrete services, maybe one's written in Kotlin, maybe one's written in, in, in Scala, uh, maybe you have Swift server side um, or Go, right? All of these things can do talk in discrete ways, be sent to the client, the client just sees it as a JSON blob which is then parsed, and delivered just like any other data stream and then you can deliver all these discrete things. So we add it all together and uh, we as an industry decided that services was way, the way to go, right? We, we were, we're gonna go with services. So is everyone still with me? That was a lot really fast, but I wanted to get you up to speed as far as why REST is what it is today. And I'm just gonna say it, I'm not gonna talk about SOAP. I'm not a big fan of SOAP. SOAP is gnarly to work with. The XML format is, is crazy. The envelope, you have that parsers, et cetera. This isn't a SOAP talk. We're gonna talk about REST today. So where does REST fit in? 
So um, Roy Thomas Felding created the REST uh, uh, architecture and paradigm back in 2000. It was actually his PhD dissertation. And can I take an aside for a second? Roy's personal web domain, are you ready for this? Is roy.gbiv, okay? If that's not hilarious, I don't know what was. I was cracking up when I saw that. He owns .gbiv and its subdomain's Roy. Anyway, um, maybe it's not as funny. Uh, so his uh, PhD dissertation was architectural styles and the design of network-based software architectures, which is a mouthful, but the whole idea about it was this idea of representational state transfer, or is what we like to call REST. And there was a few cornerstones to the REST paradigm. One is that it was stateless, the idea of stateless, and we're, we're going to dive into stateless more in a moment. The HTTP methods were strictly enforced. So um, when, we, when we talk about methods, uh, again, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that more in a moment. Uh, and standardized data elements for consistency purposes was huge. So if you think about the 2000s, this uh, idea of Web 1.0 or 1.1 was still in, if, in its infancy. And so we had like headers and, and the whole idea behind REST or, or one of the biggest um, concerns that Roy had when he when he actually uh, created the REST paradigm was that like the host header wasn't even a uh, consistent thing back then. And he's like, man, REST would work awesome if we just sent the host with every request. But that wasn't a common practice in 2000. So um, that was one of the things that kind of held him back. And, and, and uh, Roy actually helped design the standards for, for uh, Web 1.0 and Web 1.1. Web and, and he helped uh, with, with building Apache, et cetera. But we've come a long way. But um, when we talk about data elements, Roy was basically speaking to different things that we see as just normal HTTP traffic now, right? So he was talking about resources, like where the intended target of our, uh, our communication is going, then the resource identifier, right? The URL, URI, URN, et cetera. Um, the representation of the data that you are transmitting to and from, right? So we're talking about, back then, HTML documents. JPEGs. Now, this is stolen directly from his dissertation. So some of these things may not match exactly from the, from the, um, the terminology that we use today. But this is the exact kind of things that he was worried about when he created the rest, uh, the rest uh, uh, paradigm. Uh, we talked about metadata, right? Media type, last modified time. Anyone familiar with HTTP headers? This is the stuff that you see in those headers, right? Um, metadata, control data, cache. Caching was big when REST was being thought up because of this whole statelessness and the ability to um, be able to transmit a large amount of data over internet that wasn't really fast and, and optimized as it is today. So then, as I mentioned, we go into HTTP methods. And HTTP, uh, RESTful APIs uh, enable you to develop web applications with all possible CRUD operations. So CRUD, if you're not familiar, is create, Retrieve, update, and delete. So if we map those to HTTP methods, that comes out to be post, uh, an HTTP post method is for creation. A get method is for reading or querying. A put method is to update or replace. Patch is to partially update or modify. And delete is to delete a record from a data store. This seems pretty straightforward. But I do have a question. What, is, what, are this, what does this mapping mean to security folks in here? What kind of problems could you see arising from using these methods in this manner? Go ahead, sir. Where data is sent, like any other address, where it can be stored, retrieved, or put. Okay, so. Oh, okay. So, so uh, just to repeat if you didn't hear. So, uh, Scott's answer was. Where data is being transmitted in the HTTP request specifically concerns with HTTP um, uh, URI parameters or, or query parameters. And that's exactly right. So information leakage via URL per query parameters is a real concern. But remember, if we're using REST as it was intended to be used, if we're querying a backend data store, we're supposed to be using the get method. So if your lookup is SSN, you're now transmitting an SSN as a query parameter. And every time I see that, my absolute, every time, my reaction is, 
what are those? Every time I see some crazy amount of data being transmitted in a query parameter, right? Because think about query parameters, right? They're cached on the browser. They're cached in proxies. They're available in web app logs. They're available in um, load balancer logs. So this whole idea of using CRUD operations exactly how they're meant to be used is a little bit uh, interesting. But Rastafarians be like, one love, four verbs, right? You're supposed to use those things. I got one good laugh. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> I was cracking up when I found this. Like, who made this? This is great. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, if you talk to someone about the REST standards and how REST should be utilized, they will swear that you have to use those methods and only those methods, and if you do anything else outside of those methods, you are wrong. But you'll get a pass from security guy, because I think you're right. So let's agree to disagree on that one. Um, we'll continue on the rest. And it's going to pick up a little bit. I just want to take you on, a, on a, uh, basically a tale of where rest came from. It was really uh, the reason it's so, it's so widely used now is because of this whole microservice architecture is why I want to introduce you to that. Taking you on a history tour of rest and, and, and kind of where the, the, uh, the spec came from. And then we'll get into some fun uh, technical deep dive. So, so hang with me if this is, this is a, a little bit uh, too high level. But when we talk about RESTful services, remember one of the goals is to statelessly pass information as data representations. So in today's REST services, what we usually see are key value pairs, right? So you see something like YAML, people familiar with YAML? Like four people, again, cool. Uh, so YAML is basically this, uh, again, this key value pair. So you have a presentation, the name of the presentation is REST is a sweet sauce of labor, the venue is besides Pittsburgh, right? Pretty straightforward uh, key value pair. You can also send REST services with XML, which is interesting. Again, one of the reasons I'm not a huge fan of SOAP is because of the whole SOAP envelope and XML and parsing and all that fun stuff. But you can actually have a RESTful service which is uh, delivered via XML key value pairs. So the key is time and the value is 0900, which I think we were a little after 0900 today. Oh, we'll continue. And then uh, the biggest and best, and, and, and how many people are familiar with JSON? Lots more. Yeah. JSON's taken over. Is it JSON or Jason? JSON. JSON, thank you. Yeah. It's object notation. It's not JSON. Um, so JSON, uh, it's, it's similar key value pairs to YAML, but um, a little bit to, uh, of the, uh, the consistency is a little bit different where you, you pass in um, the, the value pair with, with each uh, param. So we have this data, right? and it's sent in a request or a response, then what happens? Well, it's received, parsed, and processed for further activities. So what does that look like if we think back to our architecture uh, uh, thought process? It might be client-side rendering, right? We talked about JavaScript frameworks. They might take that data, pull it in, use client-side JavaScript, parse it all up, figure out how it maps to, to, to the, uh, the client, and then display it in a way that the user has no idea how that information was transmitted. But in reality, it was via a RESTful API that was completely discrete from the, you know, so say they're checking the balance of their, their bank account, it's a completely discrete web service from when they did the login authentication or when they are gonna do a transfer, right? But at the end of the day, it looks very seamless to the customer up front because it's just data being represented and parsed on the client side. There's also the inverse of that. It might be sent from the client in a post, get whatever, received on the server, and then maybe put in a data store somewhere or munge some way on the, on the server side, right? So it can be used for both, right? Data representation can be used for both. But there's also a third, right? You could have middleware, right? So this doesn't really touch the client at all. You could be doing some type of normal uh, interaction with a client app. Data is sent uh, or is received to the server side. And then the server uses RESTful APIs to talk amongst another server or maybe AWS or what have you. So at the end of the day, REST can be used in a variety of different ways. And it's really just a transport method for data. Just think of it as a transport method for data. So when we talk about 
restrictions or guidelines to be restful, right? Other than people saying, you got to follow the CRUD operations, which again, I'm going to tell you, you don't have to. So that's your first rule that you can break. There's the other thing, there's the other thing about statelessness, right? They're going to say, you have to be stateless to be a REST service. If you have RESTful services, they have to be stateless. Well, and that's not really necessarily true either. We'll get to that in a second. But one thing that is always tried and true is any REST services can be marketed as an API and you can sell it to customers. That's a universal truth. If you have a REST service, market it as an API and sell it to your customers. No, but uh, I digress. When we talk about statelessness, let's dig into that a little bit further. So the HTTP protocol is stateless. So when we talk about REST, being a uh, uh, you know higher up in the the uh, the model, it's a little bit interesting that we're layering a stateless um, service on top of a stateless protocol, right? Where does the state come into play here, or should it not? Well, if we don't have state, things kind of tend to break on how our users use the web in in today's standards. And what I mean by that is people basically have created these sidesteps around stateful exper uh, uh, experiences. So you have things like uh, client-side sessions, client-side storage, which basically give you pseudo stateless experiences. But what about authorization headers, right? OAuth tokens, bearer auth, et cetera. That's still a state. If you're passing that information, you're still mapping that on the back end for uh, authentication and authorization. So you can call it stateless, but at the end of the day, that's still stateful in some manner. Um, and if we don't, how do we, or, or on the same lines, how do we revoke in the circumstance of compromise? So if you are using a, state, uh, a um, client-side session, what happens if someone steals the user's client side session or compromises the server storage of the, of the uh, identifiers. Um, and then the other thing is, can our users log out, right? If you use client side sessions, do you know what the, the um, most, the biggest way that our applications are implementing log out with client side sessions? Anyone want to throw it out? I heard a couple people. They just delete the cookie or the header, or, or the jot, or whatever the case is, they just delete it. That's not log out, that's just deletion. What happens if there's a net network error, or what happens if uh, someone thinks they're logged out, but someone had already grabbed that token via man in the middle, or a uh, local exploit, and um, now the user thinks they're logged out, but someone still has a valid session, right? This is, this is like inverse. I can see you, but you can't see me. I like it. <laughs> um, And, and if you say a JWT or JOT, a JSON web token, is the answer to this? I don't want to hear it. Don't at me. We're not going to have this discussion. I'm not a fan of, of JWT as an answer to statelessness with REST services. So we're just going to gloss over that right now. All right. So again, I've spit a lot at you so far. I talked to you about monolithic versus microservices and why REST is so prevalent in our environments today and how they've kind of risen up. And then I talk, took you on a, a history lesson of where REST came from and how it's being used and misused today in our environments. So let's discuss security tooling and how we can test REST services or ascertain and document and understand how REST services work. But first, is everyone still with me? I'm talking really fast, right? No, we're good? All right. So tooling. How many people have heard of Swagger? Good. Uh, Postman? A little more. Insomnia? One person. Cool. Um, how about Link Finder? Awesome, one person as well. Cool. And other uh, security-centric tooling we're going to go into. So Swagger. Swagger's tagline is design, build, document, test, and standardize. Who here thinks design, build, document, test, and standardize sounds like a good thing? I want to see everyone's hands. Good. All right. So my perspective on Swagger. Um, it's great as a testing harness because it has a built-in web UI to invoke REST services, or APIs in general. Um, and the reason why I say I like the web UI thing is because from a web hacker or attacker or, or, or a web security guy, I like things that are in the browser because I'm already used to working with things in the browser. So if it's not a, an extra tool, if it's not a, a, a installable thick client, electron client, et cetera, things seem to work a little bit better for me. So, so 
I dig that. I, I dig that it's built right into to the, the web. Uh, basically, you deploy it on, on your app server, and, and it'll do some self-documenting and stuff. Uh, so yeah, you can use it on AWS. You can use it on Azure. You can use it on-prem, internal, uh, completely you know, firewalled off from your external, which is, which is cool. Document, documenting APIs or REST services is, gr is a good thing. I think everyone can agree on that. And Swagger will help you do that with some self-documenting features. Um, but there are some quirks with Swagger. First of all, it's owned and operated by SmartBear. And if anyone's ever used, who's used SOAP UI in here? Is SOAP UI easy to work with? No, it's not. And so you'll see a little bit of that come through. Swagger's awesome. I'm not, not, not saying, but you'll see a little bit of the SOAP UI uh, contextual menus and, and, um, and kind of thought process in the Swagger UI because it's, it's, it's uh, brought to you by the same folks. So if we zoom in a little bit here, this is what Swagger looks like. And we're probably going to be a little pixelated. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, you can't see anything. Um, <laughs> let me read you what the colors are. <laughs> So, wow, that's, that's, I'm sorry. Um, so what you see there is basically a documentation of several API endpoints. So the green is a post, the orange is a put, the blue is a get, and I'll go to the next slide, which unfortunately I don't think you're going to be able to see. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but basically how you interact with, you can drill down into that API endpoint, and you actually see the JSON of what the endpoint is expecting there, uh, right there on your screen, and there's self, some self-documenting features, right? So you can say, like, um, this one is petstore.swagger.io, which is a demo that you can actually go out and use if you're interested in, in seeing Swagger in use. Uh, but this one is for adding a pet to the back-end data store. So it's a post request, and the post request is expecting this data array, uh, which is in, in, in JSON rep representation. So you as an auditor or a pen tester or a developer or someone getting just used to, to the ropes can go out to the Swagger UI and see exactly what the backend API is expecting because it's documented in the, the uh, Swagger UI. So Swagger is pretty cool. There's also Postman, which some of you were more familiar with Postman. Postman's tagline is uh, Postman's tools support every stage of the API lifecycle. They had a lot of buzzwords there. I think, I think we're, we're on the right track, right? So what can you do with Postman? They have collections, which is very similar to your Swagger documentation. Um, can invoke calls, document calls, et cetera. There's workspaces. So workspaces is, and, and this is their term. I didn't, I didn't come up with this. I don't want to hear groans. Workspaces is an A-D-E. Anyone want to guess A-D-E? What's that stand for? Say it louder, sorry. API development environment. IDEs weren't enough, guys. We're on ADEs now, right? So uh, yeah, it's an integrated workspace where you can actually deploy code directly from your, your uh, Postman uh, interface. Of course, there's uh, hooks and, 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 and uh, Docker and, and whatever buzzword you want to use uh, right in uh, that will make it easier to deploy. But that is, I mean, that's a pretty cool thing. But could they just call it an IDE and stop there? Um, and there's also tooling built in. So you can do like load tests, unit tests, uh, integration tests some security testing, uh, which we'll, we'll uh, maybe dive into a, a little bit. So my POV on Postman, if you're interested, Postman is a thick client in the form of an Electron app. Who here is familiar with Electron applications? So like four people again. Um, I must like the number four. Um, so Electron apps are basically built on the Chromium engine. Who here uses Chrome browser? A lot of people. What's one of the uh, biggest drawbacks to using Chrome versus some of the other uh, browsers? So you get great security, renders really quickly, they have a, a good uh, a V8 to JavaScript engine. What's like the one drawback of using Chrome over the others? Memory. Memory. So the problem with Electron is it also uses a lot of memory. So um, when you're using, say, Chrome and Slack, and Postman, and Rike, and whatever other Electron apps. Bye-bye RAM, right? This thing only can do 16 gigs of RAM, and I'm 
pegged already just using like four tools. So it's interesting. They're all, there is a browser plugin, but I think that's deprecated. I don't think they're going to continue development from the Postman end on, uh, on the, the browser plugin. So that's, it's not deployed on the server. It's a local client that you use. So that's maybe a drawback. Um, so collections, again, our documentation built with, with harnesses, very similar to the, to the Swagger UI uh, perspective. And again, documentation is good. I don't care who you are, if you're a developer, if you're a security person, if you're a CISO, if you're a CEO, if someone comes to you and say, hey, look, I've documented this thing to death. It's really good. I'm going to applaud that person, right? Documentation is awesome. So having built-in documentation is, is great. Um, but the one thing that's interesting with Postman is um, there's tons of options, tons of configurations, which makes the learning curve a little bit higher, as well as uh, it can be a little bit tricky to proxy. If you've never proxied traffic from an Electron app before, uh, or I'm sorry, from Postman directly before, it takes a little bit of, of intuition to get set up and, and reading the docs and adding this and changing environmental variables here, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so sometimes it's easier just to proxy the whole damn thing. Just feed the uh, Postman app a command line, uh, line um, flag when you enter into Postman, and you can just proxy the whole app. Um, and again, goodbye RAM, right? It's an Electron app. So that's my two cents on, on, on Postman. Um, you're not going to be able to. <laughs> this is like abstract representation of what Postman looks like, but... The idea here is you have your operations on the, on the left there, right? Your API documentation. Uh, in the middle here, you have the actual uh, requests. So where my mouse is here, you have uh, the HTTP verb get. And then here is the URI path. And then down here is the actual body of the JSON uh, method that, that, or the JSON uh, representation that you're sending, et cetera. If you're interested in trying out Postman, either in a security context or maybe a business context, et cetera, uh, just go to getpostman.com, download the client, and it has built in um, uh, demo endpoints that you can play with and, and, and start to, to understand and ascertain. Just don't hack those endpoints. The same with the, uh, the, the pet store swagger thing. Like, I don't own those. I'm not giving you permission to hack them. So just my uh, word of caution. So the next one uh, is insomnia. So insomnia is tagline, debug APIs like a human, not a robot. Well, I'm not a robot, so this is already sound, sounding kind of good. Um, in all honesty, it's similar features at the Postman collections. It just doesn't have the ADE and tools built into it. It's another thick client, uh, Electron app, but honestly, it just feels lighter. It it's, uh, takes less resources. It's open source, so if you're one of those folks and you enjoy open source software like I do, that's always a good thing. Um, that's the GitHub uh, link up there. It has a slightly a counterintuitive interface compared to Swagger UI and, and uh, Postman. But how many of you in here have used Burp Suite? So about half. Awesome. How many of you in here have used Zap? A little bit less. How many people can switch seamlessly between Burp Suite and Zap? Nobody. One? What? I don't know. You use them both. All right. Me, I'm like, where do I set this at? I don't know what I'm looking at. Is this even English, right? So I think it's just a tool thing. Once you get used to using Insomnia, you can probably transition between Postman and Swagger and Insomnia pretty seamlessly. But uh, if you have any trouble, ask this guy. He just can switch UIs like, like uh, King. Um, OK, cool. So those are all when you have API endpoints that are documented in a way that you can use an interface to then um, uh, interact. But what if you are testing an application or tasked with documenting an internal API that maybe you don't have source code for? Or maybe you don't have the chops to review source code to find the API endpoints? Or what if you're on a penetration test or you're doing bug bounties and you want to be able to find all the API endpoints of a, of a certain app? That's where Link Finder comes in. I love this tool. It's written in Python. Uh, basically, what it does is you feed it a JavaScript file or a burp state. You can feed it a burp state, and it will actually go out, parse the JavaScript, beautify it, unminify it, et cetera, find all your API endpoints, and then give you a nice output of all the API endpoints where then you can then go and invoke. Now, it won't give you the actual JSON pretty print of what the endpoint is, ex uh, is expecting, but uh, it's really good for those times where you may not have code, but you want to find API endpoints to then test. 
Um, like I said, it has J J uh, JavaScript Beautifier, Unminify. You can do regexes and, and search trains, et cetera. And I'm going to show you a demo, but I don't know if you're even going to be able to see it. Uh, that's something. OK. So um, yeah, that's actually not bad. OK. So what I have here is uh, the tool. Like I said, it's written in Python, linkfinder.py. So Python, linkfinder.py. Uh, link um, dash i is feeding in a JavaScript file in which I want to parse. Dash o is giving me an output of an HTML format. So what this tool is going to do, it's going to go out to a JavaScript endpoint, find all the APIs, uh, or I'm sorry, JavaScript file, find all the API endpoints, try to parse them out, and then give them back to me in an HTML file that I can actually do something with. So let's see this in action. No! Uh, am I not connected? OK, well, that's not going to be good. I have a backup. I think I'm just not connected to Wi-Fi, but. So this is what the output looks like. So anyone here heard of JuShop? Like three people. So JuShop is a vulnerable web application by OWASP to uh, have fun with. This is my instance of JuShop. Don't hack it. I mean, it is available out there, but don't hack it because uh, I don't know. I could just nuke the instance, I guess. But uh, anyway, um, JuShop is written in, in uh, client-side JavaScript and has its endpoint called JuShop min.js. And this is the whole interface. This is everything you interface with on the client side is defined in this JavaScript file. Because remember, if you are using a web app to interface with an application, you have to know where to send requests to, right? You can't just say like, oh, check my balance. And the browser comes back to you and like, what's the endpoint for balance checking, right? I don't, I don't even know. So it has to be defined somewhere if you're not using like a mobile app or a thick client app that comes with those things, those registers already are predefined. So web apps, what they normally do is use something like JavaScript to represent this information. It's parsed on the client side, and then all of a sudden the browser knows when I want to request a transfer, this is the endpoint that I want to hit it with. The problem is it's usually minified and, and, and crazy and you can't find this. So that's what tool does. So if I go through here, there's an API endpoint that is login or OAuth or baskets, QR code, et cetera, right? This took all of that uh, uh, minified JavaScript, made it nice, parsed it out, gave me something that I can then go test with. And now what's the first thing I'm going to do? I'm going to go to every one of those API endpoints and see if I can hit it unauthenticated or see what kind of data it spits back, or maybe cause a stack trace error message and send it some, some uh, fuzzed info, right? So this is really cool if you are interested in testing APIs, but maybe don't have the back end code for something like Postman or Swagger uh, or Insomnia. If I can get my slides back. There we go. All right. So when we talk about security concerns, I talked about tooling and how we can start testing some of these, invoking these methods using these handlers. But what are actual concerns when we talk about REST? Well, I hope this isn't a big womp womp for everyone out there, but the same web stuff that you're used to testing pretty much applies to REST, uh, the entire top 10. But there are also some specifics, right? So like gray and black box, I already talked about link finder. You can also use like API manuals, user manuals, OSINT, Google Dorks, et cetera, to try to find REST API endpoints. Because again, REST services aren't usually defined in one like HTML doc. They're usually pulled down and parsed uh, uh, separately. So sometimes just finding the AP API endpoints to hit is a challenge when you're testing REST. In addition, some tooling doesn't take advantage of pass style parameter manipulation as REST uh, does. They're basically used to uh, looking at uh, you know standard gets posts, the path isn't changing much, maybe add a, a one uh, path parameter on and calling it a day. It's not actually going through the tree and uh, going in and changing maybe user one slash account balance. And it's not going back in, in the path and saying user two, user three, account balance, et cetera. Uh, so just something to keep, keep an eye on as far as your tools, if there are uh, properly set for uh, path style parameter manipulations. 
And then also something big in REST is this idea of using signatures for anti-tampering. And signatures can be a bear. So that's another thing that you might have to uh, um, think of when you're doing security testing uh, specifically to REST. So real quick, injection, broken authentication, sensitive data exposure, XML entity injection. Remember, REST bodies can be XML. If you're parsing XML, you're vulnerable to XML uh, entity injection, possibly, depending on your configuration. Broken access control, security misconfig, cross-site scripting, depending on your, your content type. Uh, DSEER, using components with uh, known vulnerabilities and insufficient logging and monitoring. I know I just literally recited to you the 2017 OWASP top 10 list, but the idea is all of those apply to REST services. You're not getting out of anything. There might be some, some out of the box configurations that make you less susceptible to some of these, like maybe using text plane or content hub JSON might help you from cross-site scripting concerns, but if you then take that data and drop it into HTML somewhere, you still could have some cross-site scripting concerns, right? So be cognizant of all the OAuth top 10 stuff when you're doing security testing for REST. I'm flying here. Everyone still with me? Maybe buy me, if you, if you got uh, uh, caught up on something, uh, is, is it open bar? I don't know, open bar? Open bar, so just go get me a drink, bring it over, and I'll, I'll go back over some of this stuff. Um, how much time do we have left? Oh, cool. All right. So we'll, well, you guys, uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but I'd like to do a demo for you if, if you guys are cool with that. Cool. So this is OWASP Juice Shop. Again, I, I, I kind of um, alluded to this. So OWASP Juice Shop is a JavaScript application that has backend REST services. It is purposely vulnerable. But the cool thing about Juice Shop is it's really easy to deploy. So if you want to like go out and spin up a, a local instance on Docker, there's already Docker Hub images of Juice Shop. If you want to deploy to uh, Heroku, you literally create an account in Heroku, click the publish, and you get an instance where you can just test it. And Heroku is completely OK with this, as long as you're not doing uh, denial of service attacks or anything else that could cause uh, damage to their underlying containers. So uh, if, and this is another plug for OWASP Pittsburgh, if you're interested in doing this, OWASP Pittsburgh is having a uh, web app hacking night next month. It's June 18th, I believe, or July 18th, excuse me. Uh, and we're actually going to be hacking Juice Shop um, and, and having some fun. So if you're interested, come out, and, and I'll show you how to, how to do some of this stuff. But um, anyway, so this is an instance of Juice Shop. If I scroll down through here, you can see like there's all kinds of, of fake products and uh, all kinds of stuff. You can click on it and, and, and get some information. I think my internet dropped off, so you're not seeing everything here. Uh, let me see if I can connect. I'm going to unplug for one second. I'm not, I'm not joining your shady MiFi. <laughs> he had it all set up, like, ready, like, here's my MiFi. No, 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 I, know, I appreciate it, man. I'm just giving you a hard time. No, I, have, I actually had my hotspot on, but uh, one second. You guys are all like, I should have gone to Brian's talk. He didn't have problems with Wi-Fi. Maybe. I might be joining your, your uh, MiFi here in a second. Oh, pay per minute. I see like everyone else's uh, MiFi is here except for my own phone. There it is. Woo. Okay. We back? We're back. All right, let's test it out real quick. We're not back. It's uh. trying. Demo gods. I can show you some stuff with that. 
All right, well, I'm not going to take your time. So while that's doing this, I already have burp. I already parsed the endpoint. I know burp is going to be terrible when I'm, I'm trying to present to you. But this is the directory structure of Juice Shop. And here are the REST API endpoints. Surprise, they're under the REST directory. And then you can see admin, product, user, et cetera. So if you kind of want an idea of what kind of things I would start doing with testing REST, is I would take one of these REST endpoints and send it to repeater, and open up repeater. And oh, this is lovely. Um, so you can see here that git rest admin application version. And this is my host header, right? Uh, Cody juice shop. And uh, it's a git request, so there's no, there's no parameter. So what happens if I hit that? Oh, look, I am connected. OK, so we have a version 7.3.0, which is interesting because this is an admin endpoint and I'm completely unauthenticated. So maybe that's my first concern, right? That someone's requesting admin API endpoints from a completely unauthenticated session and they're able to get back version data. That could be a concern. Um, but basically, that's what I would start to do. So I would parse the API endpoints. One uh, cool thing is there's actually a burp extension called Swagger Parser. So you can go into Swagger Parser hit the file, pull in your, or your .json swagger file, open it up, and it actually parses the endpoints out of the swagger file for you. And then you can right click those and send send a repeater. And now I can actually use my proxy, which I'm already used to using, right whole burp versus zap and, and this and that, right? I live eight hours a day five days a week, maybe six or seven days a week, in burp. So I'm very familiar with using burp. So now I just took my Swagger doc. And um, cool thing is Postman, you can export as Swagger doc. So either way, this will work. And uh, I just imported it into my proxy. And now I can actually send requests directly from here. And you can see here, Amazon saying that's a bad, bad endpoint because I didn't put in the, the params. But uh, yeah, it works, it works pretty well. It's pretty cool. But um, anyway, so I would go through my normal testing process, right? I would go down that OAuth top 10. I'd look for broken access controls. I'd look for caching issues. I'd look for um, configuration issues, et cetera. And I would just start going down through my testing process. Once you understand the basics of how REST works, why REST was created, some of the pitfalls of REST, to be completely honest, the testing part is exactly the same as you would normally do. If you're a QA tester, you pretty much QA test exactly the same. Just knowing how the architecture is set up and how parameters are passed and all that good stuff, now you have the knowledge to go out and do your QA testing. Or if you're a pen tester or a security person, you go through your same testing process. You just now know a little bit more about why REST works the way it does, how things on the back end might be architected, and now you can attack things a little bit differently. So. Um, this isn't the best setup to do a, a whole lot of demos, but hopefully that makes a little bit sense and you got a little bit of something out of, out of the, uh, the proxy stuff. So just to, to wrap things up, we went over monolithic services versus microservices, why microservices are making uh, such a, a big headway in, in our uh, enterprises and infrastructure today, and why REST is then so hot right now, right? Because REST uh, is easy to implement at the microservice level. We went over REST 101, a fun history of where REST came from, where it is now, some things that versus stateful and stateless and uh, um, the, the CRUD method, uh, methods and all that fun stuff. Talked about tooling with Swagger, Postman, Insomnia, Link Finder, Burp extensions, everyone's leaving, um, security concerns. I'll open it up for questions. Oh, I'm sorry, follow up about the OWASP of a web hacking night. Uh, my slides will be available uh, both on my personal blog as well as my company blog, invisium.com. And uh, stop by the Lockpick Village later. I bought an IoT thing that we're going to hack, and it's going to be some fun. So if you're interested in that, stop by there. N N V I S I U M. N V I S I U M. N V I S I U M. That's my employer. But they didn't pay me to say that. Maybe they did. Maybe they paid me to say that. Um, <laughs> Thanks to B-Sides Pittsburgh volunteers, attendees, vendors, family, and you guys. Without you guys, we wouldn't be here. Or I wouldn't be here. Or maybe I would. Okay. Questions? Any questions? Scared to ask questions. All right. I'll be around. Um, I have, I have three separate install disks, like old Windows 3.1 now. So uh, that's how you can identify me. Yes, question. Um, how do you get involved with OAuth? 
I'm sorry, say that one more time. So OWASP in general, Open Web Application Security Project is uh, uh, completely dedicated to um, resources and understanding web application security, mobile application security, and it's kind of evolved from there. Um, but um, Pittsburgh chapter in general is just a complete open meetup. Uh, I don't require any type of dues or um, membership or anything like that. Um, there, you can be a member to the larger OWASP community and you'll fund projects like Juice Shop, you'll fund projects like the Top 10, but when it comes to OWASP Pittsburgh, uh, just go out on meetup.com or uh, OWASP Wiki and search for Pittsburgh and uh, come out to our events. You're more than welcome to participate. You're more than welcome to become my, my co-lead. You're more than welcome to present. Uh, just hit me up. There's also um, OWASPGH on Twitter. So, uh, you know, uh, look for that. I always post the events and stuff like that. So, yeah, um, completely open group. Everyone's welcome, and I'd love to have more participation. Like I said, meeting next Thursday, and then July 18th is our uh, first web app hacking meetup. So thank you for the question. Awesome question. Anyone else? I talk too fast. I'm sorry. If you see me, grab me. I'm happy to do demos or, or, or uh, answer any specific questions. But you guys are awesome. Seriously, thank you all. Go.